this morning, and uh, thank you, Deb, for your part in this this morning. We, uh, you know, I have the privilege of um, teaching a few students every semester through Nazarene Bible College who come to the end of their formal education and who do what is called supervised ministry experience, which is an 18 weeks of teaming them up with a mentor in their local position in their local area and um, teaming them up with a congregation, three members of their own congregation who meet together on a weekly basis to discuss 35 different ministry functions in a very practical kind of way. And one of the things that comes out of that is I have the privilege of overseeing all of that for each of those classes and to give input to what their mentors are telling them and working with them. And I've been particularly aware of the fact in the last, um, in the last couple of weeks that um, how blessed we are here at Greater Life to have uh, the pastors that we have and also the congregation that uh, blesses and responds in a tremendous way. Many of you may not know, but Richard and Rhonda actually um, do a ministry that touches a lot of our visitors and a lot of our shut-ins, those that can't make it to worship for various reasons. And uh, they have the ability to do that. And God has used them and blessed them in some tremendous ways. And so we're delighted to have them. In fact, uh, someone said to me the other day, they said, how many pastors are in your church and, and retired pastors? And when they were told how many, they went, what? Because not always is that seen as a positive thing. But to me, it is to have these men and women who are part of this. And we appreciate it so much. We look forward to meeting with the board this afternoon at 3 o'clock in the conference room, and we'll be looking at a particular uh, ministry that is available to us, and we look forward to that as well. Today, um, we fi finish the final week of a series that we've been on called Hope is Here. And if you were here from the very beginning on uh, the Back to Church Sunday, the first one, we talked about the hope that comes in Christ Jesus who invites all those who are weary and heavy laden. Come and learn of him, take the yoke upon me and learn of me. And Jesus said, I will give you rest. The second week, we discovered that there's hope for those who are broken because of their own sin or the sin that's been done to them. And we discovered that in the midst of that, hope is forgiveness and the ability and the power, because we have been forgiven, to forgive others who have sinned against us. And last week, we talked about the hope for the underdog because when we run to God with our worst nightmares, He has the ability to take our worst nightmares and our greatest disgrace and turn it into grace-filled living as He did for Jabez, if you recall that. If you missed any of those Sundays, they're available on the, the live stream on Facebook and, or on our website. And, Many um, uh, look at that during the week and I encourage you, if you missed any of those, they're available there. The final week we want to talk about is perhaps the hardest of all the other places to find hope in our lives. And the question we ask today is, is there hope for the doubter? You ever had any doubts? What do you have doubts about? Is there hope for one that struggles with faith? Is there hope for one that struggles to believe, that struggles to know what is true and what is false? What do you believe and how do you deal with your doubts? I want to do an experiment here this morning that um, might be helpful to you in this experiment as well. I want to ask you a question. It will be on the screen. And then I want you to respond whether you believe that that is true or, or whether you doubt it. And so you're ready. And if you believe it's true, you trust it, raise your hand. If you don't believe it's true or you don't trust it, just leave your head and hands down. You ready? Here's the first question. It's on your screen. What is it? I well, thought it was going to be on the screen. Maybe not going to be on the screen. All right, let's do it this way. Oh, here we go. Did you know that every day on average, 11 banks are robbed in the U.S.? How many trust that? <laughs> How many doubt it? Well, 
If you go to several sources, they will tell you that that is true. Eleven banks on the average are robbed every day. Now, here's another one. Did you know that you are more likely to be stung by a bee in windy weather? How many trust that? All of you doubt it. Yeah, you doubt it. Yeah, well, that's true. Uh, you're not more likely to be stung by a bee in windy weather. Here's one. Do you know that they have square watermelons in Japan because it's easier to stack them? How many trust that? How many of you doubt that? A few people doubt that. Well, you can go Google it. They actually do have square watermelons in Japan, and they grow them in a box, and that's how they get them square so that they can make them compact and stackable. The last one, did you know that penguins can smell toothpaste from a mile away? How many trust that? <laughs> How many doubt that? <laughs> well, it's false. They probably can't uh, smell toothpaste a mile away. But sometimes it's hard to believe what you can trust and what, what, what you should doubt. Doubt has become a common occurrence for many of us within our culture today. And there are people we know who have failed us, and so we come to doubt certain things. It causes us to doubt. Or we come up against so much false information that we, we are not sure what to believe. And oh my, how true that becomes on social media today. I read recently of a note that was sent to me in this past week um, about... Um, a requirement in a particular institution with a group called the Board of Trustees, and they were writing their conclusions about what had supposedly been sent out in a letter, and someone challenged that very strongly. And so the person who had put it out there to begin with just simply copied the letter and put it back out there for everybody to see, and there you could read the letter. Well, the truth was is that they actually didn't say what was concluded exactly, but when you read the letter, it certainly could be implied that way. What do you trust? What do you doubt in your life? How do you know what the truth is? How do you know that it's accurately interpreted? And you live in this world, people doubt for all kinds of reasons, but the question is, are the doubts really the problem? I'm going to suggest and say to you this morning that the problem is not with doubts because in reality, doubts must be in play if we ever have faith. In order to have faith in one thing, you must doubt the opposite. There has to be doubts in our life. In fact, sometimes out of our doubts comes the growth of our faith and it comes down to not having doubts. It comes down not that we have them, but what we do with them. What do we do with the doubts that we have? Faith requires that we have doubts about the opposite of the object of faith. It comes down to how you manage it. And mishandled skepticism can oftentimes result in a tremendous lack of hope. The great philosopher Rene Descartes put it this way. He said, if you would become a real seeker after truth, it's necessary that at least once in your life you doubt as far as possible all things. What he was saying is everything needs to be explored. Everything needs to be examined. We need, we need to learn to doubt our doubts and develop and experiment. I, I want to I wanna do a little experiment here this morning, and um, Slater, I'm wondering if you'd come and help me. I want you to come and help me. You've been around me a long time. I think you have reason to trust me. Do you? He hopes so. He hopes I don't disappoint him. I'm, I'm going to blindfold you here this morning. Uh, we're going to do a little exercise. All right, you ready for this? I didn't tell him I was going to do this. So he didn't even have a chance to say no. I guess he could have said no. Can you see anything? All right. Can I trust you? <laughs> Can you breathe? Am I over your nose? Oh, my goodness. We don't want all that. Here, that's not going to work. I don't, want, I don't want to have to do that. I thought we had it up for the... Let's try it this way. Can't... <laughs> 
All right, I need somebody with 101 and how to tie a blindfold. Now you can see? Fold it in half again. I may need Becky to come and help me with this. Can I do it? You can tell. How about that? Woohoo! Somehow they didn't train us in seminary about this. Just close, uh, trust him to close his eyes. Now I know Slater pretty well. Uh, how's that? How's that? That work? All right, I want you to stand right here like this. Now you've probably done this before, but um, do you trust me? That sounds, that sounds rather doubtful, doesn't it? Slater, I want you, um, when I say one, two, three, I want you just to fall back. Relax and fall. I'm going to catch you. You believe me? <laughs> Don't listen to the crowd. They'll lead you astray. All right, you ready? One, two, three. <laughs> I was there, buddy. Was I not? Was I not? Let's, let's try that one more time. And so now, I want you to trust me again. I want you to just, when I say one, two, three, just fall back. You ready for that? Can you do that? Yes. One, two, three. <laughs> well, he didn't trust me. He trusts me when I'm behind him. He doesn't trust me when I'm not. Can you get that off? Now, I would never fail you, Slater. I wouldn't have let you fall. And so I want you to turn around and see who was there. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. You're a great sport. Give me a hand. Yeah, that's right. One time I trust, but I'm not sure I can trust in another situation. I can trust when the voice is behind me where I expect it to be, but I can't trust when the voice is in front of me. How do you handle your doubts? Well, there's an encounter in Scripture that I want us to look at this morning in which a father really wanted something really bad. And oftentimes our doubts are challenged at the point when we really need something. What we come to believe about something happens usually when I really desperately need for something to be true in my life. And there was a father in the scripture that really wanted something for his son. In fact, he had a young son who was in deep, deep trouble. He had been physically ill and spiritually ill most of his life. And the father was struggling with the doubts of how to get help for his son. He had brought them to the experts in the law and the spiritual realm, and they were not able to give answers for healing for his son. And so he had finally brought them to the immediate chosen disciples of Jesus, and the disciples had tried to heal him, but they could not. And the story already implies that the medical world and the science of the day had given up on him. They had totally given up on being able to affect any change in his life. And so we come to this, this moment when Jesus, just fresh off of a mountain where there's been a great worship service with his disciples, three of his disciples, James and John and Peter, he had just been in the presence of God with Elijah and Moses, and they'd had this wonderful, brilliant experience. In fact, Jesus had literally lit up with the brilliance of the glory of God, so much so that when he came down the mountain, the people could see the glow like they did when Moses came off the mountain in meeting with God. And Jesus comes down from the mountain, this great glory, and he enters into, at the bottom of the mountain, an argument that's going on. We pick up the story in Mark chapter 9. If you have your Bibles this morning and want to read along with it, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 14. When they returned from the mountain to the other disciples who were at the bottom of the mountain, 
They saw a large crowd surrounding them and some teachers of religious law were arguing with them. So here is this moment of peace and awe on the mountain and they come down to dissension and debate. Have you ever felt like that? You've been in a great moment. You've been on vacation and you're just breathing in the air and no pressure and no phones ringing. It's just been a wonderful, wonderful time. And then you get home and Monday comes and you're back to work. Verse 15, when the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe, and they ran to greet him. Why were they overcome with awe? Usually the awe in the scripture comes after the miracle, but in this case, it's before the miracle, which would signify that Jesus was still glowing from the glory of God after he'd come down from the mountain. Verse 16, Jesus asked, what's all this arguing about? And one of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, now, catch the 16 and 17. Mark just kind of, he likes to write immediately a lot. He likes to just make the story keep going. But between 16 and 17, there's this pause where nobody wants to answer. You ever been a, in a fight and somebody walked in and said, what are you fighting about? And you didn't want to tell them? One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He's possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. And then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. And Jesus said to all of them, You faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring me the boy. And so they brought the boy. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it again threw the child into a violent convulsion and he fell to the ground writhing and foaming at the mouth. And Jesus said, how long has this been happening? And the father replied, since he was a little boy. The spirit often throws him in the fire in the water trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean if I can't? Jesus asked, anything is possible if a person believes. And the father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help thou me to overcome my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers was beginning to grow, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak. I, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. And the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. And the boy appeared to be dead. In fact, the murmur ran through the crowd as people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet. And he stood up. And afterward, when Jesus was alone in his house with the disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out the evil spirit? And Jesus replied, this kind can only be cast out only by prayer. Can you imagine what would happen if that happened in this place today? Some of you would exit the building immediately. Think of it. The center of attention is the young boy. What's the problem? What's he dealing with here? What's the diagnosis? Well, from the medical scientific view, the descriptions of doctors who have studied this and looked at this from the medical point of view, it's all the descriptions of the disease or the illness of epilepsy. And yet the interesting thing about the story is, is that it's very clear that there is an evil spirit involved in this story as well. And it has persisted in this young boy for a, quite a while. And if there's anything that um, challenges our faith and ignites our doubts, it, it comes at this very moment where we look into these problems of humanity and we, we see physical explanations, but we don't understand the spiritual realm and the psychological realm. 
And the indication here is that, that this physical illness was in true a physical illness, but it was being influenced by a demonic spirit that created a mute condition so the boy could not talk. The boy was experiencing a triple whammy. He had a physical ailment. He had a spiritual problem, and he, and he couldn't even speak. And it begins to create doubts which destroy this father's hope that any deliverance would ever be possible for his boy. He's not even sure of the diagnosis. He's been told so many things from so many different fields of experts. It creates the confusion and the fear. It raises the question for us in a modern world of science and medicine. Can a person's physical or mental illness involve a demonic spirit? Can a person be possessed by a demonic spirit? Can a child be possessed by a demonic spirit? Can the use of drugs cause a person to become possessed or influenced by demonic spirits? I had a father actually stop me in the community this week and ask me that very question about his daughter who's been hooked and addicted to drugs and she's been to, in a, been to rehabilitation numerous amounts of times and is still using and there seems to be no hope or no deliverance, no matter what they tried to bring the deliverance. The indication of the various passages of Scripture, especially here in Mark, is that it's possible that we are dealing both with a physical illness, a mental, what we would call a mental illness, as well as being influenced by a demonic spirit. Now, there's the age of dilemma, isn't it? There's the dilemma for us, isn't it? Because in a world of science coupled with the fascination with the paranormal and the occult, we're immediately set up for doubts and a divide. What do you put your faith in? Do you put your faith in science? What do you do with the demonic spirit's influence on science and medicine? Doubt it? Deny it? Do you put your faith in the spirit world, in the paranormal normal world, in the occult, and think that somehow you have the ability to control the spirit world? I often look at all of the decorations on lawns as I drive in and out of my neighborhood, and, and all of the, the, some of them go to great odds and ends to, to create graveyards and bones and skulls and death and, and, and all of the, uh, uh, the, morbid stuff that they come up witches hanging from trees and, and all kinds of stuff and I'm, I'm thinking what's, what's behind oh it's just a holiday pastor it's just a holiday I wonder sometimes if, if at the subconscious level we, we love to do that because we like to think at the subconscious level that somehow we might be able to control something in the, in the, in the spirit world that we otherwise don't feel comfortable with and so we figure we can just face it and we can control it. Maybe this morning, you're here this morning listening to our live stream, you've dabbled in the demonic world unaware. The fact is, is that your science will fail you when it comes to spiritual issues. Your science will not be able to heal spiritual issues that are involved in physical and mental illness. Your faith in spiritual exorcism and incantations and, and ten steps to deliverance as many in the spiritual and the religious realm have those kinds of things. And the Hebrews and the, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees had volumes of books in their day of ways to get the spirits to leave people, those who were possessed. And it ends up with a lot of doubts and hopelessness because the sickness and the illness is not healed and faith gets frustrated and eventually it's destroyed in anything that can help us and when that happens in our lack of faith faith in the wrong things and in our doubts that'll drive us in several directions and I, I want to just highlight in this, this morning a couple of things that happens when we begin to live in this dissension and this doubts and we don't have the faith and we don't know what to trust 
It always leads to several things. In fact, a lack of faith in Jesus will increase your doubts about what is true. If Jesus isn't the center of faith, then you're going to doubt about the whole business of truth because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If I doubt that, then I'm going to live with a lot of, a lot of doubts about what the truth really is. And it'll lead to several things. And the first thing that comes out of this story is it always leads to dissension and arguing. Do you notice that? The teachers of the law arguing with the disciples about what the problem really is and what will bring the cure. The doctors had given up on him. They couldn't heal epilepsy, nor could they heal the demonic influence in this young boy. And, and the father and the boy, as a result then, become victims and political pawns of the experts. And nobody has an answer. The church doesn't have an answer. Science doesn't have an answer. The disciples of Jesus don't even have an answer. And he struggles to believe anything as the story presents with us here. You think about it, nothing's really has changed, has it? We live in a world in which you don't have to go very far to get an argument about anything. <laughs> we get an argument about diseases and drugs and whether they work or not and which do and which do not and whose science is the true science and which science can you trust and what are the best proven methods and, and the intense abusive arguments over the power and control of truth and free speech and public health. Who has the reality? Who gets to drive the narrative? What do we believe? Opinions become like belly buttons. Everybody has one. <laughs> and I've tried to imagine what it would be like if Jesus walked into those arguments. What do you think would happen? If Jesus walked in and said, what are you, what are you guys arguing about? What would happen? I think he does this morning. I think he's coming into the relationships in your life. He's coming into the stuff that you're dealing with in your family. He's coming into the stuff that you're dealing with at your job. And he walks into the room and he actually says, he says, if we'll listen, what are you arguing about? What are you fighting about? And what happens? Exactly what just happened then. It gets real quiet. Nobody wants to talk about it. In front of Jesus. And, and in the story what intrigues me is. Is it's not the experts who finally speak up to talk about what they're arguing about. It's the victim who finally speaks. It's the voice of the victim that has to rise to the top. When Jesus asks the question. Nobody else wants to answer that question. But the victim comes. And he describes the problem of his son. And he, and he just admits the hopelessness of it all. He's filled with doubts. He had hoped the disciples would help, but they couldn't. Now, when I'm filled with doubts and I lack of faith and I don't know Jesus, then there's something else that happens that comes out of the story. For you see, the victim that can't find answers anywhere else then wants to try to control their own environment. They try to do anything. They'll manipulate. They'll, they'll lie. They'll do all kinds of things to try to control their en environment because they have the second thing that flows out of this is the need for power and control. Now, you almost miss this if you, if, if, if you don't read it carefully. Some translation says that the, in the 18th verse that the father said to Jesus, I asked the disciples to heal my son. In the original language, it's a far cry from ask. That, that's a poor translation. What it actually says is, 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 I told your disciples to heal my son, and I want it now. That's the emphasis of the Greek. Here is the victim who's tried everything, and finally he comes to the disciples of Jesus. Jesus is absent, and so he demands, he commands, he makes a mandate on his disciples. I want healing for my son. It's not an invitation. It's not an exploration. It's not a request. It's a mandate and a demand. You fix my 
problem and you do it now. You're the disciples of Jesus, so give me what I need. And can I suggest to you this morning, the moment you begin to mandate some attempt or manipulate some kind of healing in your life, that, that, that what flows immediately out of that is you've set yourself up for doubts about what the truth is. Because the disciples couldn't meet the demands or the mandates. And when you make demands on other people for the needs in your life that belong to Jesus, then the end result is you're, you're going you're gonna to be leading, le leading with disappointment. That's what's going to happen next. And that's exactly what happens next. You end up with disappointment with people and sometimes with God. Notice the Father in the interchange with Jesus. It's hopeless. I've commanded your disciples to do, and they couldn't do it. And the teachers of the law, they got their stuff. The doctors have given up on the whole thing. The science is out the window. The religious understanding's out the window. Nobody has an answer for this, and we're always debating and arguing. But Jesus is never in it. And so the father says to Jesus, you know, we're in a desperate way. I don't know what else to say. Would you have mercy on us and please help us? If you can. Can you hear the voice? If you can. And he's talking to the king of the universe. He's talking to the one who created us in the image of God. Who took dust and formed it into a human being and breathed the breath of life into it and becomes the very definition of health. He's talking to the healer of healers. If you can. <laughs> you see, when your faith is in anything other than Jesus, there's going to be disappointment and doubts and a lack of faith that God can really change anything in your situation. Why do we do that? Well, I think it's evident, among other reasons, we doubt sometimes to protect ourselves. The doubt that we often express is a way of keeping ourselves from getting our hopes up that things in our life could improve, that God might answer our prayer, or that even God loves us, or that God even loves me. We often don't want to believe, our, but because if we believe it and then our hopes are dashed, we're afraid that, that God will not come through in some way. Think about it. What's the first thing that many of us say when good news comes, unbelievable good news? We say things like, no way. Or we say things like, you've got to be kidding me. That can't be true. We respond with our doubts because we're protecting ourselves. You see, sometimes it takes a while for the hope to be able to begin to rise in our doubts. And if you'll notice that the disciples, we'll see this again and again in the Gospels, the doubts and the struggle of the disciples comes to the forefront and they're asking the question to Jesus now in private, how come we didn't have the power? How come we couldn't cast out the demonic spirits for this, this father and this boy? And Jesus drills right through to the heart of the problem that's the problem of humanity in general, and he does it in one sentence. These things only come about by prayer. What's he saying? Well, how many prayers do I have to pray? That becomes evidence of the problem. It's not about how many prayers you pray, because prayer is not about saying words to some being we can't see. 
Prayer suggests there is a conversation of intimacy with the creator of the universe and we've come into personal relationship with him and we understand that we are not the center of the universe, that we submit ourselves to the fullness of God himself and the problem the disciples deal with and the problem you and I deal with in these moments of doubt when we struggle with our faith is at the core of it is our own self-centeredness that we were born with. It's called the sin nature. You didn't ask to have it. You were born with it. It's the result of Adam and Eve's sin. It's not something you've done. So you can't be forgiven of this self-centeredness because you didn't do anything to get it. It's just inbred in you. All of sin that comes short of the glory of God. It is the sin nature that lives in us that defined as self-sovereignty. The, the root of sin is not something you do. It begins with something that we have, a foreign entity of self-sovereignty in our lives that breaks us from having an intimate relationship with God, even though we may believe in Him. We can't connect with Him. And the disciples found themselves and would find themselves this way until Pentecost would come along. And we see this all the way along the line. And so they're powerless. You see, the disciples didn't bother to connect with the Father or talk to God at all. They just started trying to heal people and do spiritual things out of their own flesh and out of their own, well, Jesus could do it. We just ought to be able to say the name of Jesus and things will happen. They never talked to God. And Jesus said, you didn't talk to anybody. You didn't connect. You just went in your own flesh. And how do we know that? Because notice the focus in this passage. Their question even betrays them. Jesus, why couldn't we heal the boy? Why couldn't we? Who's we? It's us, the humans, the limited, the finite. Why couldn't we do this? And Jesus said, you've missed the whole point. I can't even do these things. I only do what my Father does, John tells us. I only, only do what I do in instruction from the Father. I don't diagnose anything without the Father. I have come and I'm totally dependent upon the Father. I've emptied myself of all of my divine powers to show you that we have to be dependent upon the Father through the Holy Spirit. And, and the Scripture makes it clear. Even Jesus going into temptation, he was led of the Spirit. Into temptation. We try to go in by ourselves. We try to be the healers by ourselves. And to the extent that we begin to believe that we have this power, that's a lie of the enemy. It's the deepest, most damaging lie in all of the human race. And to the extent that you begin to believe that lie, you lend yourself to the influence of demonic powers. You say, well, what are you saying, Pastor? Well, I'm demon-possessed. No, you can watch a continuum that goes along the line. This isn't just black and white. Jesus is saying, you, you can be under demonic influence and even be a believer because you believe the lies. You believe the lies that the enemy comes in your direction. Listen to these lies. Some of you are struggling with these lies this morning. The lie that comes into your mind. I'm no good. God could never love me. You know, I have these bad thoughts. And the Bible says that if you have the thoughts, it's as, it's as bad as if you did them. And so I just as well go do it. I can never be normal, healthy, or well. They would be better off without me. Things will never change. See the continuum? And once you give yourself over to those lies, if you keep living in those lies, to the extent that you begin to live out those lies, there comes a moment when it can be said of you that you have an obsession to the lies of a demonic spirit. 
A believer cannot be demon-possessed, but they can have the influence of the demonic powers in their life. And a child cannot be demon-controlled unless, first of all, there's been somewhere where the parents have failed. Nobody or somebody has failed to lead this child in an understanding of who he is in the presence of God. And they may just let them live. And we're dealing in a culture and a society where parents have left children to make sense of their own lives, to fend for themselves, no discipline, no nothing. Just let them do whatever until we come to the place in our school systems. We don't know what to do with them but to have a policy that says when they throw a fit and start throwing desks and chairs, just clear the room and take everybody outside. We don't have a clue what to do. Or we take them to the doctor and they put them on some some sedative that will settle them down. And the fact is they're living out of demonic lies that they're unlovable and that they're out of control. And I, I've dealt with these. I remember a young man some years ago that, that was having trouble with anger and all kinds of things. He would literally run away from home and he'd throw things and he'd walk out and just leave at three years of age. When that began to happen, I began to realize that we're not just dealing with some physical issue. You could go to the doctor, they'd give him a sedative, and they want to get him into counseling and want to do all those things. Well, you can do all of those things, but that was, there, there's more to it than that. And I began to pray and to seek God and his understanding and discernment to know what to do and when to intervene and work with this young man. And, and today, he's grown and years have passed and we watched that begin to happen, and we watched him fall in love with Jesus and, and his whole life. And I think back to what would have happened if nobody had intersected his life with the truth that goes beyond medicine and science and, well, you need to act this way. We dealt with the pain in his life. And the good news is this morning there's freedom and deliverance and victory over demonic powers. And there's healing over demonic powers and disease that is driven by demonic forces. But you cannot know what that is without a connection with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I love this story because what it tells me is that Jesus is not afraid of our doubts. In fact, in fact, Jesus is pretty, pretty right out front with this. In fact, the first thing that I notice about Jesus is that he confronts your conflicts. He gets into your life. He's, he's, he's getting into some of your life this morning, and he's asking you the question, what are you arguing about this week? What have you been fighting about in your home? What have you been fighting about in your marriage? What have you been fighting about with your kids? What are you fighting about with your employer? What's going on in your life? What are you guys arguing about? What is exactly the problem here? And you don't have an answer. There's silence until the victims speak, unless they're silenced by the experts. But Jesus invites us to bring our questions. He invites you to bring fights. He invites you to bring your doubts. He invites you. He's in the middle of those. He doesn't run away from that. He doesn't stand and lecture you. He wants to listen to you and know what you're doing. And the second thing I notice is that Jesus challenges your control. He listens with compassion, but he'll challenge your control. There's a whole lot of people in the church today who have lost their hope and their faith in Jesus of who they thought he was because of what's happened in the world. But he invites us to come with our questions, but he's going to challenge your control methods. i got to be right. I can't be wrong. I'm not going to talk to somebody else that disagrees with me. Jesus says, nah, -uh. not while I'm in the room. And he challenges the control methods. Well, if you can help us, Jesus, but, 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 but you don't know the people I have to live with. If you can, and Jesus says, if I can, anything is possible if you believe. He welcomes the questions. And the last thing he does this morning is he calls us to this connection. Which ultimately for the disciples and for us was a call to die to themselves and their self-centeredness. 
Jesus told his disciples that the power over demonic forces and physical disease and mental illness only comes ultimately by prayer. We can medicate, we can do behavior modification techniques, but it's God alone that can diagnose what the real issue is. And you and I cannot do that by ourselves. And we need the discernment of the situation. And you may not have all the answers, but I can tell you this morning that the Holy Spirit will lead you to the truth that will set you free. And you begin to live out of his strength and his power and not out of your weakness. And even in your weakness, his strength becomes perfect. The power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Why do you need that? Because the last of this story really disturbs me. You see, if I'm, if I'm self-centered and I'm living out of the flesh, I won't be able, I'll run from the last part of this story. I won't stay there. I'll live in my doubts. Did you notice what happened in the last part of this story when Jesus speaks to the Spirit and casts out the demon? What happens? Everything gets worse and all hell breaks loose. And if you're not settled in the Spirit and full of the Spirit of God, that'll freak you out and you'll run because it looks like Jesus has made it worse. And in fact, the crowd did. They looked at the whole thing. Convulses and the boy in their eyes dies. Oh, thanks a lot, Jesus. You killed my son. Thank you. That's the way the world would see it. And the crowd couldn't help it. They're murmuring, yeah, he's dead. Boy, that, yeah, that's a that big help. I can just see Jesus standing there just letting him soak in that for a while. You know, he's dead. So much for that Messiah. Told you. And then the scripture says, he went over and raised him up. And went home healed. I want to say to you something this morning. When you begin to live in the spirit. And you begin to deal in people's lives. And we pray for healing. Sometimes the immediate response is worse. Because demons don't give up easily. And if you don't have an understanding of demonic power, you're just living in the human flesh. You'll think the world has come to an end. When in fact, it's the final death throes of the demon that has to surrender to the power of the king of kings and the healer of healers. And if we're going to be the church that God wants us to be, we begin to learn to listen to where people are at, not just what their diagnosis is, but we listen to the hurts. We listen for what's behind it. We listen to the language. We listen to the doubts. We listen to where the pain is. We listen to where the struggle is. And when we do that, we begin to be able to live in the place where hope can come to the hopeless. We learn to empathize with compassion in the struggle. And we begin to build the bridge back into those lives. And Jesus is not afraid of our doubts. We shouldn't be afraid of other people's doubts either. We go from being in doubt to fullness. And the doubts begin to melt away. And Jesus becomes the source of our hope. And we begin to be able to see what Jesus can do. And it's no longer about what we can do, but what Jesus can do in and through us. Because Jesus becomes the source of hope. We don't have to be del crippled by our doubts and even when we feel like our faith is wavering and our confidence is shaking our faith is not in our faith our faith is in Jesus and he does not change he's the same yesterday today and forever I remember the story of Robert Louis Stevenson one of the greatest novelists of the 20th century wrote about one of his excursions to the South Sea Islands where the ship encountered a terrible storm and the passengers were freaking out. They were frantic and panicked. And 
Finally, one brave soul braved the going out and moving up to the deck, up to the captain's quarters, and, and through the rain and the wind. And he, as he came up into view of the captain's deck, he noticed that the captain, with his face facing into the storm, pacing back and forth with a very calm and cool and collected, peaceful look on his face. And he watched it for a little bit. There seemed to be no disturbance in the captain's face. There was this tranquil kind of, of countenance about him. And he was giving orders to the, to the crew how to handle the ship in the middle of the storm. And then the captain turned in the middle and saw him, the man standing there. And he just turned at him and just smiled. The man made his way back down to the cabin where the other passengers were huddled together in their fear and their panic. And, and they began to say, well, what did he say? Did you see the captain? What did he say? Well, what's going to happen? Are we going to perish in this storm? And the man responded, no. He said, we're not going to perish. I have seen the captain's face and all is well. I want to say to you this morning, I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know where your doubts are. I don't know what you're struggling with. But you're invited to see the face of the captain Jesus who knows exactly what's needed and he knows how to move in and around the demonic spirits and to cast them out. He knows how to deal with our doubts. He knows how to build our faith. He knows about our illnesses. He knows about our psychological problems. He knows about all of it. He knows what's organic and what's not organic, what is spiritual and what is spiritual in the organic. He knows how they all come together and he wants to show us and use us and fill us us and use us to deliver those who are broken in the world that we live in if we dare to walk in the power of the Spirit. And in fact, Jesus left us with a supper. He left us with a supper to remind us to remember him. And in fact, he said, as oft as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. I want you to see my face. I want you to look into my face. I don't know what storm you're going through. We're, we're headed for the cross. I've overcome the cross now. But you're carrying the cross and you're headed into the seas. And you're living in a world that's broken. But I've already been there. And as we sang this morning, I've already overcome. Look at my face. And as often as you come to the table, look into my face. I have overcome. And he invites us to a supper that not only represents the fact that he can come through in resurrection power out of the cross and out of the tomb and out of death, but that he is the same Jesus who is preparing a place for us so that where he is there, you and me may be also. And we can trust him. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told, trust me, trust me. Look into my face. I've brought you this far. I'll give you the grace, amazing grace, to lead you all the way home. And so we come to this table this morning in which Jesus sat down with the disciples in the midst of one of the greatest storms of all time. The disciples were filled with doubt. Jesus invited them to come with all their doubts. Is this the Messiah? Do we dare trust him? Is he really going to have to die over my dead body? I don't want that to happen. I'll see to it it doesn't, Jesus. And in the midst of it all, Jesus said to his disciples, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and remember that it was my body, broken, that you might be healed. And on the same night, Jesus took the cup. And when he had blessed it, he did something he'd never done before. He said, this isn't just the blood of any lamb. This is the blood, my blood, the blood of the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. My blood is given for you. When you take it and drink, remember 
that I've overcome sin and I've overcome death and I've overcome your illnesses for by his stripes we are healed I invite you to come bring it all to him and as you take this remember remember me look into my face all is well all is well I invite you to take your elements this morning and to open the bread And as you hold the bread out this morning, it represents the flesh. It represents the world we live in. It represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ lived in a broken world. Just before you take the bread this morning, I want you to hear his voice. In fact, just bow your heads for a moment. I want you to listen to the